Okay, we are ready to start our final session and try to put sort of a bookend on um, this rather remarkable day, I think, of uh, discussion. At least for me, it's gone um, incredibly quickly. And uh, so we probably aren't going to be able to touch on absolutely everything that's been discussed before, but try to hit some uh, major themes. Uh, you can see who we all are by looking at the uh, slide, and so I'm not going to spend any time on introductions, but rather plunge right in. And um, I'm going to go to uh, Gabe first, because we've had a day of, of basically listening to people coming from the perspective of journalists or from people who are journalists or journalism professors. Um, but um, I think Gabe will bring a different perspective, at least somewhat. and. Um, I suspect one of the things he's going to say is that uh, perhaps uh, journalists tend to undervalue the national security interests that we've been talking about or talked about for much of the morning. So, Gabe. Thanks very much. And this has really been a fascinating conference for me to attend. I, I'm not a journalist, as you said. And uh, to see the discussion that's going on, really very interesting. I want to say a few words about how I came to the subject. Uh, my formal training is in a field that no longer exists. Soviet politics, <laughs> which I got my PhD in 1989, exquisite, exquisite timing. Uh, I come to this subject not as a former government official or as a journalist, but as a writer of the New York City subways. Uh, uh, I was in New York for 9-11. I was in New York for the, during the Madrid bombing of the, their transit system, the London bombing. I ride the subways. My children ride the subways. Several million people do. So um, in, in, two th in, early, in late 2005, I was, the Wall Street Journal uh, assigned me uh, James Risen's book, State of War, for review. Uh, and you know, reading this book, as not really knowing all that much about uh, the laws governing secrecy, I asked myself the question, is it legal to publish these national security secrets that are, that are, that are you know, the book is replete with? And, it turned out to be uh, not a simple question to answer, and the result was a book uh, that, that um, I think you know, does a pretty good job, if I can praise it myself, of covering the, land, the territory there uh, of, of the law and its evolution uh, governing uh, the publication of classified information. Now, the book um, touches on many of the, uh, the subjects, that, the points that were raised by Eric Lichtblau uh, this morning. Uh, but uh, we come to rather different uh, conclusions, and I, I just want to just touch on some of the, some of the differences, and then we can you know, move on. Um, I agree with him that the U.S. government uh, generates, keeps too many secrets. I, I agree with him that many of those secrets are of innocuous information that should be declassified. I agree with him that the uh, press has an indispensable role in publishing and uncovering you know, secret government activities that, that, are, that are of interest to the public. Now, where I disagree with him is that uh, I think his assessment that the media has uh, been overwhelmingly responsible in carrying out that function, uh, I think it has been responsible in many cases, but I think there are also in the post-9-11 era cases where it's been you know, radically irresponsible. Uh, just give several instances. Uh, all, I'll just give several instances all involving the Times, but there, I could go to other media outlets. One was the publication in, in uh, June 2006, Eric Licklau and James Risen, of a story exposing the workings of a counterterrorism program that tracked the movement of terrorist funds. Uh, Eric talked, touched upon this this morning. This was a legal program. This was a program operating under the rule of law. The Times' own ombudsman came to the conclusion that the Times should not have published it because of the, the, the way it compromised our ability to monitor these funds and their movement, which is one of the key ways for tracking terrorism. More recently, the Times published, uh, and this is in the Snowden documents, published uh, information revealing how Al-Qaeda was communicating and how the, how the NSA was tapping into their computers while they were not hooked up to the internet. Uh, and that seems to me a story with very little public value and left a great deal of value to Al-Qaeda, uh, knowing that they, are, they were vulnerable in that way. And then there's the story that, that uh, I, you know, I think is generating the most attention these days, is 
uh, because James Risen is uh, facing possible contempt citation for not revealing his source, is the story of, of, the, of the CIA operation to, uh, to mislead the Iranians about uh, their, their, nuclear, their nuclear designs, which, which, is some, which is a story that he uncovered early in the, uh, early in the 2000s. And this is a fascinating episode here because he went to the government and, with the Times editors and said, you know, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to publish this story. And you know, Jill Abramson, the Washington Bureau of the Times, and, and Risen were met with Condoleezza Rice and General Hayden. And they said, look, if you do that, you're going to blow a valuable program. There's a CIA asset that's going to get killed. Don't publish it. The Times did the responsible thing. They did not publish it. James Risen turned around and published it in his book. That's the issue now that's getting him uh, in trouble with the, in this contempt proceedings that may, that may take place. He hasn't been cast out of the journalistic profession for publishing a story that the Times itself saw as quite damaging. They evidently agreed with the government's assessment. They were persuaded. They're usually not persuaded of such things when the government makes that case. So I think it's a, it's a uh, an extraordinary case, and uh, I'm surprised at how, uh, how much support and sympathy he's gotten in the journalistic world, or it's a reflection of some of the, some of the um, I think, attitudes toward national security uh, in the press. Now, I disagree with, him, with, uh, with Eric Lichtblau about the First Amendment being an unlimited license to publish national security secrets. I think the First Amendment does obviously gives a great deal of leeway, but in the final analysis, it is not editors and journalists who get to decide what it is prosecutors, courts, judges, and ultimately juries under our law. Uh, and um, that's, not the, that's not our system of practice, but that's our system of law. In practice, editors and, and journalists are deciding. That's because there's never been a prosecution of journalists in our history. And that's because journalists, to a large degree, have exercised forbearance in publishing secrets. But now, I think with the rise of some of these stories by the Times, with the appearance of WikiLeaks, the Snowden documents, that forbearance on the part of prosecutors is likely to erode because the, of the national security equities that are being jeopardized. And uh, uh, that, that would be a very bad thing for the country, I think, to have a prosecution of journalists. But to some degree, the media itself might be, or elements in the media might be responsible for that unhappy result if it occurs, because the, because the First Amendment is not a suicide pact. And I'll close there. Jay, I'm going to turn it over to you. And um, one of the questions that it seems to me that's raised by, by uh, Gabe's remarks and uh, by much of the discussion this morning is sort of um, things boiling down to who we should trust, when we should trust them, why we should trust them, do we trust the government? Do we trust the media? Do we trust certain speakers? Can you sort this out a bit? Well, thank you very much, uh, first of all, for inviting me to this conference. It's been a fascinating day for me. This is a subject I wrote a lot about over the summer when the Snowden leaks first came out. So I'm, I'm very honored to be here. Um, as to your question of, of who do we trust in this situation? Um, I realized in, in preparing these brief remarks that I faced a conflict between being truthful in addressing that and being helpful. And I decided to go with truthful, but as a result, what I'm going to say is not going to be very helpful. <laughs> and I apologize for that, but what can I do? I'm, I'm a truth teller. Uh, so he, here's, here's my general view of the question of who do we trust. The system is broken. <clears throat> its legitimacy is paper thin. The words that justify it do not correspond to the way the thing works. The system depends on trust, but it cannot reproduce that trust because the routine practices of actors within the system corroded. These problems are well known, but no one intends to do a thing about them. There is no plan to fix it because routines would have to change 
and the costs of changing those kinds of routines are just too big. So there is drift, followed by crisis, followed by rage, which then cools, leaving the system broken and in place, which leads back to what I said at the beginning, the system is broken. So I'm going to give you three or four examples of that, and you'll see what I mean, and then you'll see why I'm not being very helpful. First, let's take the, the very basic principle of informed consent. We learn about it in grade school because it's bedrock for our system of government. Government proceeds by the consent of the governed. But of course, the second thing you learn in grade school is that we have a representative system. And so the people who actually govern are the ones that we chose. And so in order to keep them accountable to us, we have to be informed of what they are doing. But we also have, in the congressional system, the committee system. And so for the surveillance state, we have not Congress that is kept informed, but a subset of Congress that is supposed to be kept informed. And they're supposed to keep the rest of Congress informed, which is then subject to our votes. But it's clear that that system doesn't work because when conservative Republican James Sensenbrenner revolts and says he doesn't think that bulk collection of telephone records is either legal or what the Patriot Act was intended for, and says he's going to sponsor legislation to make that impossible, then it's clear that the system of informed consent within both Congress and the United States doesn't work because that was a decision to collect everyone's telephone records that passed through the committee system. But once it became public, it lacked legitimacy. And that's why conservative Republican James Sensenbrenner is immediately saying he's outraged by it and he's going to try and turn it over because that system is broken. It doesn't work. Uh, another example, which Gabriel mentioned, is overclassification of secrets. And the vast expansion since 9-11 of the number of people with security clearances, many of whom don't even work for the government, they work for private contractors. No one believes that the system of classification works now. No one has any intention of changing it. No one thinks that millions of people with, cl with clearances are going to be able to keep secrets, but no one has any intention of, of cutting that back either. And so overclassification is not a problem that anybody intends to do anything about because changing a practice that has become that routinized is a, a very expensive and difficult proposition. Moving to journalism, the system of granting anonymity to sources is supposed to produce legitimacy and trust. This is the way it's supposed to work. Journalists know that we need to know who the sources of our information are, and so they're supposed to grant anonymity only when uh, the information is of such public interest that the loss of the name of the source is justified. But there is no review for that decision because we can't determine whether they made a good bargain for us because we don't know who the source is. Meanwhile, routine practice is for journalists to grant anonymity for trivial reasons that don't, in fact, justify the practice. And nobody in the press really ha intends to do anything about that either. A couple of uh, uh, weeks ago, there was a very amusing example where Bill Carter, the television reporter for the New York Times, gave anonymity to CNN executives to defend their coverage of Flight 370. So now we have a situation in which responsible officials within CNN are namelessly defending their own decisions because they don't want to speak up for it using their own names. That's an obvious abuse of the system of anonymous sources. It's not only an abuse of that system, it's a violation of the Times' own rules about granting anonymity, something the ombudsman writes about all the time, but nobody has any intention of disciplining Bill Carter because routine practice is to overgrant anonymity and to change that routine practice would be so expensive and so difficult and put you in war with your reporters so much that everybody just throws up their hands and says, it's not worth it. 
Um, another example would be whistleblower protection. It's supposed to work. It's supposed to allow someone with valid concerns that the United States may be breaking the law or engaging in horrific practices to alert the system within the system without going outside of it. But as anybody who's looked carefully at it knows, the system of protections for whistleblowers has broken down repeatedly and it is not a viable option for somebody with really dangerous information, even though it is routinely said on talk shows that it is. And again, nobody has any intention of fixing the whistleblower protection system, and we're just going to go on. Now, Snowden realized this. He knew that, that this entire system, not just the whistleblower part of it, but the whole thing was broken. That's why he didn't go the anonymous source route. That's why he decided to publicly identify himself. Later on, of course, which is the most hilarious part of the Snowden story, Bob Woodward said he shouldn't have done that and should have come to Bob Woodward instead, yeah. which is an amazing thing for a journalist to say because uh, usually you would think journalists would be on the side of more public information rather than less. So Snowden understood this. Greenwald certainly understands it. And as this um, illegitimate system of secrecy surveillance uh, goes on, more and more actors know it's not going to change, and so they just decide to change the rules on their own. So let me repeat what I said so I can underline how unhelpful I'm being today. The system is broken. Its legitimacy is paper thin. The words that justify it do not correspond to how it works. It depends on trust, but it cannot reproduce that trust because routine practices of actors within the system corrode that trust. No one intends to do anything about this. There's no plan to fix it because the costs of changing routine practices is too high. So there is drift, followed by a crisis, followed by rage, leaving this broken system in place, and we return to the top. The system is broken. That's my contribution. Well, I guess we can call it a day. And, uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I don't disagree, actually, with much of what you said. I've, I've, um, I'm reminded of, uh, in a couple of ways, of this uh, the famous remark that Justice Stewart, I think it was Justice Stewart, made in the Pentagon Papers case more than 40 years ago. When everything is classified, nothing is classified. And, uh, and that was a long time ago, obviously, that he said that. And if it was true then, it's many times more true now. Um, and I guess it makes me also think that you could substitute the word journalist for classified and say when everybody's a journalist, nobody's a journalist. Uh, and and Steve may, uh, Stephen may um, speak to that a bit, but given Jay's critique, um, is, is a greater attention to journalistic ethics um, an answer at all? Well, yeah. That's to me, you pointed to me. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Just want to say how great it's to be back here in Madison, okay? And, uh, uh, and uh, I, I don't want to get away from the seriousness of the discussion. I just want to say uh, thank you very much. And I always, I always wanted to do this to announce that. There we go. There we go. <laughs> First of all, I'm going to stand because I get restless. Uh, I, I, I like to move around. And I'll try to be five minutes, Bob. Um, I don't. I think, I actually, like people who point out that there are costs to security and, and, and printing security stories, and that I believe there are necessary secrets, where I think we would disagree as examples on how, the extent and range of that. Uh, with, 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 um, with Jay, unfortunately, on most of my dark days, I totally agree with him that the system is broken. What I'm hearing here is whether, in fact, we actually have or need a system by which we actually make decisions on security, what is revealed, how we actually make decisions about journalism ethics, and whether anyone gives a damn, or we just want to complain forever in academic journals ab about the media. I think, that's, I think that's, a, that's what I'm hearing here. And the problem is I don't have a particular uh, resolution to that. But what I'm going to do very quickly, what I plan to do, is try to put this uh, discussion of surveillance all day long into context. Open it up just a little bit. Ask yourself, what you heard today and the people you heard today, how does it actually fit into where journalism ethics is today? 
right? Here's in one, in two minutes, here's how I see it. Journalism ethics, if and to the extent that it exists and is a force, is, is the normative interpretation of a practice, a very influential institutional and social practice upon which all of us can disagree what that inter interpretation should be. The problem is that in the 19th and, and 20th centuries, this ethics came up in a professional environment, codified, put in codes. Yeah, I know, not everybody followed the codes. Uh, the, the codes of ethics. It was professionalized, it was mainstream, and so on. Then comes the internet, then comes new media, and guess what? We've got new journalists on the block, new forms of journalism, and the whole deal, and we're into this transitional period. The consensus, the, what we had, a, a professional consensus in journalism ethics is broken down. We've got multiple interpretations of what journalism is, what, who journalists are, what principles we should follow, and so on and so forth. So I'm getting back to how, do we, how could we possibly approach fixing journalism ethics, never mind the whole social system, okay? Well, you're going to have to do three things. You're going to have to be radical in your thinking, and I, I mean here the professionals, I mean uh, citizens and everyone. By radical, I mean, as a good farmer, organic farmer, uh, Paul once told me, there's a, to be ra there's a radical root in plants that keeps it alive. To be radical is to go to the fundamental basis of our, our, uh, our notions. And the problem right now that we're talking and trying to have these conversations in places like this is that there is no broad agreement on these principles. And so we have to redefine what those are and what they can be. I would point out, what could possibly impartiality mean today in the media system that we have? I would suggest to you we better rethink it very carefully. I would think, what does independence mean in this new and crazy uh, media system that we have, nonprofit journalism, Andy Hall, and so on? What does independence mean for those people? I suggest that it has to be completely redefined. That's what I mean by re a radical. Two, it has to be global, because media are now global, with global effect. So here's one application today. Should the discussion of surveillance that we had today be made more global? Two, two, two very quick questions for you. Is promoting your country's national interest the basis of your journalism ethics? And, or should we actually, as journalists, when we talk about national security issues, take into, into effect other countries, the more global situation, and perhaps think of us as global citizens? That's one way you can sort of put my thoughts to work here, is, is where we're going. And thirdly, any new journalism ethics is going to have to be what I call um, uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> integrative. We're going to have to look for common ways in which the new journalists, the old journalists, the middle journalists, and everyone else, are there any values that we share that we can actually reconstruct journalism ethics? So for me, this whole surveillance discussion we've had today is problematic in the extreme, not because I'm not criticizing the conference, it's problematic for, for two reasons. Number one, is that we don't have people in the house, enough people in the house that are doing all the new medium, all the new forms of journalism, and may, and, and may not agree with our more professional approach here. Okay? And I think that's, that's where we're going to have to go uh, in the future in, in, in these forms of discussions. I'm going to, because I'm probably using too much time, I'm going to jump ahead. And I'm not criticizing, hey, listen, I don't punch myself in the nose very often. I, I, put this, I put this format together, all right? So I'm, what I'm saying is, imagine what this conference should look like five to 10 years down the road, right? I think what it, sh what it will look like, I'm, I'm quite sure it's gonna be this way, is we're going to have a journalism ethics debate and discussion that is based in civic society completely. And the professionals will hopefully be, wanna be here with us, but we're going to have all kinds of civic groups, we're going to have a cross public real cross-public discussion of what would surveillance or whatever issue we're talking about. What would that mean and what do we want? What do we want from our media system today, right? Or we shouldn't be answering that as professional journalists alone. And so I see new models of ethics reform coming up and I'm, I'm promoting them. <laughs> and, and, and in ways in which that include the professional, but uh, create a sort of, I'm looking for ways of dialoguing about journalism ethics, which is, based in foundations, civic society, groups, bloggers, whatever, tweeters, professional writers, and so on. 
And I think that's the future for, for where we're going. I call it sort of the public, public inclusive model of ethics reform. Will we, given even if, you, if I have my dream comes true, will that fix the, the problems that, that uh, have been so eloquently uh, referred to uh, before me? Uh, I don't know, but I think it's the only way to go. So Jay is saying the system is broken, and you're suggesting that ethics, <laughs> ethics is, is broken. <laughs> broken. That's all going on. <laughs> Not broken, but fixable, or, or the consensus is broken right. now, and so on. OK, well, um, I uh, think I'm going to see whether any of the panelists have any responses to anything that either any of them have said. And if they do, fine. And if they don't, I think we'll throw it open to questions from the audience. Yeah, I think I, I, think I will respond to Jay. Uh, he's not only unhelpful, he's wrong. <laughs> but not in everything. He said a number of points in which I strongly agree with. Uh, I'll, the, the, I would agree with him that the whistleblower, whistleblower protection system in the United States, the federal level, is uh, not working all that well and uh, needs to be reformed. I don't, I'm not as pessimistic as he is that it will never be reformed. There actually are a lot of ideas percolating about how to reform it. Uh, I agree with him that uh, anonymity is used badly by the press quite often and uh, perhaps there, uh, that is more intractable, though I, I'm really not sure, because I don't really know how that works all that well. Uh, I, where I really part company with him is on the uh, notion that the system of generating, keeping secrets has become illegitimate. You know, as he noted, we are a representative democracy. Uh, obviously, there are many things that a great power like the United States has to do in secret as it conducts its foreign policy. Uh, we do have a system in which the executive branch briefs Congress on what it's doing. I think he's hanging his whole case there on the Sensenbrenner remarks. Well, you know, I think that should win the award. Sensenbrenner should win the award for one of the most disingenuous presentations uh, of, of, of 2013 because it, it's, it's well known that, he, that, he, that this was really just seeking political cover just the, the same way that Nancy, that Nancy Pelosi when she, when she claimed not to be aware of enhanced interrogation, the CIA was able to produce records showing when, where they had briefed her, just as they had briefed, Sensen, just as the NSA had briefed Sensenbrenner on what they were doing. So I think, you know, the, the, the uh, program, and I, I guess I would part company most strenuously uh, on the notion that uh, Edward Snowden uh, is a whistleblower. Uh, uh, yes, if he had stopped with the uh, revelations about the metadata surveillance, I think you could make an arguable case. I, I myself would not share it because I think it was a legitimate program, but I know many people disagree with that. But he went on from Russia to, to reveal every aspect of, of American counterterrorism and counterintelligence sur, uh, uh, surveillance, like what we do against China, what we, do, what, what we collect against North Korea, how we collect against Al Qaeda. Uh, that, that, in no sense of the, of the word, I think should be should be dignified uh, as, as whistleblowing. Uh, I think it's it's uh, you know felonious, and uh, that, for that reason, the Obama just, the Obama Justice Department uh, indicted him for on several felony counts. I think they were correct to do so. Actually, he didn't reveal anything, as you as you right. know. He took the material, he gave it to the journalists. His decision to reveal was was not. Operative. Instead, he allowed journalists using public interest tests to decide what should be revealed. That, that is that is um, really quite silly. Is it under, under that logic? Why? Under that logic, he could have published material logic, himself, but he that, didn't. Under that logic, why? Under that logic, Daniel Ellsberg didn't reveal or publish anything because he gave it to the New York Times. Well, he didn't. Well, that's silly. He well, did. Ellsberg was not the publisher. He revealed the information. He's not the publisher. It's, 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 it's really, okay. it's a distinction I, without a difference. And no, in it's fact, not. okay, he took a trove of several hundred thousand, possibly up to two million documents with him from Hawaii to, China, to, to Hong Kong and then to Russia. Now, please, that creates serious counter uh, intelligence problems. The, the, the probabilities that the Russians were able to crack his encryption are, are high. I, I was listening to the various uh, sessions here about how uh, journalists have, have difficulties protecting their information. 
Well, uh, I, I'm sure against uh, an organization like the Russian intelligence service, he was no match. Uh, okay, the, the Russian thing, I'm not gonna argue with that. I wanna respond to something that uh, Steven said, which was very challenging. See, I think what I heard Steven saying was that if we're gonna have a new journalism ethics that actually covers th these situations, it's gonna have to be global, not nation-based. And what's challenging about that is um, the press system we have is based almost entirely on the system of nation states. Every journalist today who operates under conditions of press freedom operates under conditions of press freedom because they live in a country where law secures a space for journalists to work. Mm -hmm. And in fact, two thirds of the country in the world, according to the latest Freedom House rankings, don't have those conditions at all. So the whole idea of a free and responsible press so far up to now has been entirely nation based. There really isn't any political journalism outside a national legal system that makes it possible to conduct it. However, the internet presents an, this new possibility of a, of a press that's kind of based in the properties of the internet as opposed to based in a particular nation state. And I think that's a very challenging and problematic idea, but we saw it when WikiLeaks first burst on the scene. The idea of WikiLeaks was that, as I called it at the time, it's, a, it's like a stateless news organization. Now, there's problems with that. It's not entirely true. There's ways for the state to get at the organization wherever it is. But nonetheless, the idea of a press that, um, that whose properties as a free actor emerge from the internet itself as opposed to national law and custom is, I think, a radical idea. Yeah. And we're just at the beginning of trying yeah. to discover that. Um, I just don't, I want to ask one question of sure. Stephen yet, just sure. to, for clarification purposes. I'm trying to get my head around how some sort of sense of global, a global media ethic would deal with something as specific as the revelation of classified information uh, held by the United States government. I, 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 yeah, I was actually thinking about that back there. It's, it's something I haven't really, that's a topic I actually haven't uh, thought about. What I'm, what I'm talking about is a growing, and maybe this, the answer will emerge from this, but the, a, a growing mentality that although you live in a nation, that in fact your values are, are, are global and, and connect to global networks and, and other values. So what I'm thinking about is, is that it's not a question that a global ethic would say that surveillance and national interests are not important. It's a question is where they, when they bump up against global, more global values such as human rights or universal principles or ethical principles or so on, is, is which, you know, are we as journalists able to sort of rise and take, a more, uh, take those values into consideration? My view is, is, is that all of journalism history or journalism ethic history is parochial. I totally agree with you. It's, it's, it's totally parochial. I want to challenge journalists uh, is, is to think bigger than that. I don't know in terms of surveillance. I mean, uh, what, what if we asked, what was the result of the, the Snowden documents being or information out there, not just for the United States, but what, what about other countries? What about the global uh, relationships in question, right? That would be a more global type of question to ask about this. Um, and one of the problems I had with this discussion all day long is that it's all about the United States, sorry. You know. uh, and that, 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 that in fact, that I think we've got to think larger in these questions because other countries are affected, including Canada, by the way, which I feel. I'm, I'm not answering your question, but I'm, I'm try, I, maybe somebody in the audience can help me think, uh, think through that. Yeah, let's throw. Well, uh, can I respond yeah. to that too? I, mean, there, I think there is a, a tension between journalism and citizenship. And uh, yeah. that, that, I mean, you've, that's exactly what you're touching on. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, there, it's, it's, not a new, it's not a new problem. Uh, and, you know, we saw a spectacular example of that uh, in this uh, Harvard-based uh, television show where Peter Jennings was being interviewed, and they put to him a hypothetical. You're, you're in Vietnam. You're covering a battle. American soldiers are about to be ambushed. You know they're about to be ambushed. 
do you keep the cameras rolling or do you warn them? Right. He said, keep the cameras rolling. Uh, I think that was pretty disgraceful. Uh, but many, some people in, maybe in this room disagree. Uh, so, so, but it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a difficult question in some instances. And, and in many ways, the parochialism also has, has really harmed war coverage and coverage of conflict. I know, because I was a war reporter, and I hate to go back to my days, but I was called, un more, more times I was called unpatriotic than probably any Canadian reporter ever uh, when I was in the field. Why? Well, because I actually had the, not temerity, who needs temerity to do this? Uh, I reported on uh, the Canadian peacekeepers and their activities in the Gulf One, Gulf Two, that they were without proper uh, equipment to defend themselves, that a lot of the soldiers didn't know why the hell they're in this fight anyway. Uh, but I mixed in, soldiers knew what, why they're in the fight. Uh, what my, my, the conceptual problem around parochialism is not that you don't love your country. The problem is that it gets twisted into a very narrow extreme uh, version where you're an enemy of the state, which was said earlier today. You're an enemy of the state because you have a different point of view. Well, if you want to see that view, just go to Russia and look at people who are opposing what Russia's doing in the Crimea right now, those people are being branded, the opposition leaders, whose job it is to criticize what's going on, are branded as enemies of the state and fifth columns. That's, I know, an extreme situation. But it, I tell you, you know, in my experience in journalism, is that you're always under pressure to mute criticism of government, especially when war and, and this is on. So that's where my, my, my globalism came from, from my experience in the field. And we had to start considering ourselves journalists, sorry for the, the hackneyed phrase, but more as, as global citizens. Okay, it's, it's your turn out there. <clears throat> um, this is kind of a cut to the chase question, which won't do that, but I, I raise this because I'm disappointed with all of you. Um, so we're all journalists because we're telling the truth. That's why we do this. There's different concepts of the truth. There's no such thing as objective truth. That's why there's a free press and a lot of different voices. We live in a democracy and presumably believe in a democracy, which means that it's government of the people, even in a representative democracy. That CIA asset out in the field is acting on our behalf. How do we go into with this ever with the assumption that, okay, it's fine for government to keep a few secrets because in the real world, the government has to have some secrets? Why isn't it incumbent on the government to, first of all, not keep so many secrets that gave Snowden the opening to leak them to the world? Um, it, it, why, are they in, why, aren't, why aren't they supposed to explain why it is that they're keeping so many secrets? And before anybody invokes 9-11, as someone who saw the towers burning with my own eyes. If that classified briefing saying Oba uh, Osama bin Laden determined to strike in the US had not been classified, wouldn't we have been a lot stronger because everyone would have been on guard? And now I'm done. Well, I'm disappointed in your question. <laughs> uh, because I thought I was saying what you were saying in, in your in, in, in your version, which is that the system by which the United States generates this incredible secrecy lacks legitimacy. That is my belief. It, it, it no longer operates in a legitimate fashion. And when, for example, the United States government is engaged in torture, but decides that it's classified, then the entire system that allows that to happen loses legitimacy. That's why when these things become public, the people who, yeah, probably were informed about them, disown them, not because they are lying, hypocritical, two-faced people by nature, but because they cannot justify what they did publicly. And that, when I say the system is broken, that's what I mean, is that, yeah, maybe there are a few things the government has to keep secret because relationships between states are, you know, are a matter of real politic and they can't always be revealed at the time. Possibly that's so. But the system we have now generates so many secrets that are so devastating when revealed that it does not work anymore. 
And that is why I suggested in my question to Eric earlier today, maybe the only solution to this is to narrow the gap between word and deed. Now, I don't want to sound like an irresponsible radical here, but maybe when we say we don't torture people, we shouldn't actually torture people. That's an idea, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I, 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 I'm sorry. I, I mean, I basically agree on this point. I think you know, the, the covert operations that we conduct as a superpower should be ones that, when revealed, if revealed, should be ones that, if they're on the front page of the New York Times, should not be something, should be something the American people would approve of. And uh, I would say that like the enhanced inter interrogation, call it torture or not, whether you agree with whether you think it's torture or not, and there's a debate about that still, that, that doesn't pass that test. And so I think you know, we should rein in programs, but I don't think we should go as far as you do and, and, and throw away uh, the, uh, the ability to operate in secret in some realms. And, and now back to also to this um, serious problem of overclassification and misclassification. You know, there are these huge numbers that are being thrown around of uh, five million or six million people who are uh, access to the secrets and you know, hundreds of millions of secrets being generated. There is a problem there, clearly. But we also keep in mind that you know, this is the Defense Department, uh, a whole bunch of other agencies, the contractors, many of them working in highly technical areas, like the design of weapon systems and reconnaissance and radar. And all those documents and, you, and emails can, can, about them are all classified, and I think for pretty good reason. You know, that's one of the reasons why it's so difficult to battle against the overclassification, because there's some justification for keeping you know, millions of secrets about the designs of tanks or, or uh, other, other advanced weapons. I, I, I mean, I, I, I'm with Jay and I'm, I'm with Scott, Scott, who asked the question. Strong uh, free press. All I'm saying is that it's not good to pretend that there are no costs or there are no secrets worth keeping. It, because I do not agree with some people who think that everything should be published. I agree with Scott terribly uh, about the secrets and the too many secrets totally, and we should fight back. Secondly, what I was trying to vaguely get in my general harangue about uh, new media is that we need what we would, if you're going to make an exception and call something a, a necessary risk, or necessary secret, or whatever. I want to know what your definition of a necessary secret is. Yeah, you can point me to a couple examples, but I want a theory of it, I want, I want a definition of it, I want a justification for it, and I want each case in which this is appealed to, to somebody be able to make a damn good philosophical argument that it follows the criteria intended. So we don't fall into the sloppy business of, you're just an enemy of the state because you're criticizing the government, which is ridiculous. What, and, and finally, uh, what I was trying to point out is that with the entrance of this brand new, crazy, chaotic universe of, of media and, 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 and journalists and so on, is that I'm not sure we actually agree on the language here anymore. And I was saying that what I'm trying to gesture towards a public process in which we can talk, maybe we can actually do some real ethics here and, and, and clarify some of these terms for this new media world. That's, that's sort of what I was getting at. And I don't want, I don't think these terms like you know, what is a risk, what is a harm, what's a, what, how, do we, how much harm will we accept, do we know, uh, you know epistemologically whether, what the likelihood of something happening is. We don't have a, a sort of really good theory in journalism ethics of, of answering those questions. They're what you call mid-theoretic questions. You can argue about uh, surveillance up here as a level of abstract principle. Total, total publication, no, some publication, never publish, right? A, a minimizing harm, you can, and you can dance around. And what you find out is that they sort of balance each other off. They're, there's all some legitimate, they're all got their validity. Or you can say, no, we do it on a case-by-case -case basis. What really the good work of journalism is, and what I'm challenge, trying to challenge you guys to think about, is, and what we don't have is a new theory of what is good, good security and surveillance uh, decision-making in journalism that would appeal broadly to, uh, including not the professionals, but the, the non-professionals as well. So my, my, my complaint was more on that. We, we, we've got some real work to do here in journalism ethics on these questions. So in a previous life, I had the incredibly exciting role of being a regulatory compliance reporter in Washington. And uh, for people who've never done that, I don't recommend it. Um, it, you end up having to listen to a lot of uh, very difficult policy discussions about 
laws that may not ever change. We still do not have a national data breach law, for instance, after I reported and reported and reported on it, the Obama administration recommended it, but like electri Electronic Communications Privacy Act reform, it may be years before it actually happens. But in the security discussions, um, the word risk does come up a great deal. And there's good reason for it. Because anyone who thinks about security has to manage the risk. How much of an effort do I need to harden this point to protect this person? How many resources do I allocate to this given area? And since we're at an ethics conference, it seems appropriate to talk about how journalists report on risk and security. Mm -hmm. If you ever come across Shark Week, you can think about that problem. Let's say a couple dozen people die every year around the world from sharks. Millions of people die every year because of mosquitoes. But there's no Mosquito Week on the Discovery Channel. If you look at the balance between the way that people report upon the big scary things of cybersecurity, upon uh, the uh, digital Pearl Harbor that we keep hearing about from Booz Allen's consultants, if we think about what you all are discussing here, um, how should journalists be talking about the risks of the, versus the real harms that are, in fact, I would say, uh, engendered by sucking up everything that we put together online, all of our data? How do you balance the risks to the genuine harms that are absolutely conferred by taking everything off of the internet backbone and the effect that that has upon both the national security press, but also every single American's ability to have private conversations with one another. Is that directed to anyone in particular? You can all take that. Well, I think the only answer is that we're a de deliberative democracy uh, that uh, if the, if the, if the if programs are secret, the Congress must exercise its oversight role and think very carefully about the very questions and the trade-offs uh, that, that you're mentioning. And uh, there's no real alternative to, to having uh, uh, congressional oversight. Uh, it's the best we can do. It's not a perfect system. There are going to be problems with it. But what, what is the alternative? To, to operate entirely in public? I don't think so. No, I'm, I'm just not sure I understand the question. That's why I'm not... not I mean, if you, in terms of how journalists um, report on risk in general, they do. A, we have a lot of lot of work to do on that. Uh, but I think you're asking something more specific than that. Uh, certainly, I've done a lot of, and there's a lot of studies been done in terms of how, uh, science journalism as to how um, journalists actually aren't very good at picking out, at communicating the quote-unquote real risk or objective risk of things as opposed to the perception of risk. And, and so on and so forth. So I agree with you, and I suppose all of that translates over into national security issues, maybe if in, if in written large, maybe, because the stakes are so, so important. So my, my old point of view, I mean, there is a question here also that I raised this morning that I'll bring it back, is that in, in any given situation, it may be the situation of the journalist that you can't know what the consequences of your actions are going to be. You are an epistemological, whole. And, you know, half the time I've written stories and I sort of had to take a guess at what the effect would be and I hoped it would be good. I had no idea when somebody would uh, commit suicide on a story that I wrote. I could not, you know, so, so my view is there's lots of people out there who've got lots of theories on risks. Does it apply to journalism? I don't know. Maybe, maybe we should have a look. Um, if we want to say that it's the responsibility of the press to inform Americans accurately of the risks that are part of their lives, then we cannot also say um, it's news when man bites dog. Those two ideas are in conflict. So the idea of playing up the unusual episode because it's news and it's unusual and it's you know, a story and the idea of keeping things in proportion at all times are actually in conflict. But we, as journalists, want both of those things to be true at the same time, but they're not. So what's the solution? Basically evasion, denial, and fudge work of various kinds. Um, and I think that's where we are on the communication 
of risk because if you lay, um, let's say, actual data about harms and risks on one side and then you graph it against news coverage on the other, you're not going to find something that, that coheres, that makes any sense. It, it's not going to make sense. You're going you're to find that things that are low risk are very high on the news agenda and things that are much more plausible don't make news at all under the man bites dog, dog and if, Yeah, and if I could just add, uh, if you're looking to teach this, uh, you, it, rather than just point out the mistakes that journalists make, you might want to point out where they actually do good work. The example of the Shadid Award winner today, how AP went through that, you could take that entire situation as a case study in a class and bring in risk and bring in all, and, and you know, I asked earlier, like, what's, how, think your way through it, how do you do it? Well, the editor for the, the, that was here for AP, uh, that's one way in which we can actually think our way positively and not just sort of carp about how the journalists, journalists are doing their job. Question over, oh, Dave. No, oh, sorry. So there's a couple of things that, that Gabriel said in passing that I would like Jay and Stephen to respond to. One, he said that uh, there's a tension between journalism and citizenship. And it sounds like you agree with that sometimes and other times not. And the other thing is that uh, he said the First Amendment is not a suicide pact. And I know you're talking about that in terms of national security, but in other ways, don't you think that that's exactly what the First Amendment is? That the freedom of speech and freedom of the press and freedom of religion is there in order to prevent the ossification of the government, in order to continually kill and therefore improve yeah. the government? Uh, I, would, I would say right off that uh, there is no necessary contradiction between citizenship and journalism. It, but it depends on how you define being a good citizen. Uh, my view of, of uh, journalists is that they fulfill their social role. They are patriotic and good citizens when they are critical informers, including crit crit critics of government and, and, and corporations and any other sources of power. And it, that might be branded as bad, you're being an unpatriotic citizenship, but that's just for me a bad notion of citizenship. There could be, however, a further tension between journalism and global citizenship, where again your patriotism comes into play, right? Uh, a number, and the other question was uh, suicide pact, I think the most interesting cases, uh, the really hard question cases that I was thinking about, is not so much where we report something, we kill somebody, which sounds like a suicide pact, uh, but cases where we're, where we're uncertain and we're going to do some harm, but it's not as dramatic, perhaps, as killing someone. So I'm not sure, if, I'm not sure about, I'm not a First Amendment scholar about being a suicide pact or not. I hope, certainly hope it isn't. Well, I mean, the framers, when they drafted the Constitution, did not really think all that much about protecting secrets and they wrote the First Amendment because they assumed that the U.S. government would have to protect secrets. They, that was part of their mental framework. The idea that, the pub, that there would be a, a press that would reveal war plans or intelligence gathering methods was absolutely unthinkable to them. And if you, I, mean, I have a chapter about this in my book. Mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's, just no, there's not really a debate about that. And I think, you know, you look at more than 200 years of, of jurisprudence, the Supreme Court has, has, has made it clear that the First Amendment is not absolute in the area of secrecy. I mean, back to near, near v. Minnesota, you know, the, the press could not publish the sailing dates of ships, the movement of troops. Mm -hmm. There are things they can't publish, and that was in a prior restraint case. So uh, I think there would be even a more stringent or, or uh, standard for... Uh, for cases that were ex post facto. Uh, of, uh, so I, I think, you know, just your reading of American history there is, is uh, a little, I think, tilted uh, away from what, what the framers intended and what we actually have. Uh, we can take one or two more. Yep. I just want to mention a couple of real world examples where <coughs> we've had some real ethical dilemmas on a, it's on a local reporting level, but uh, very recently, within the past several weeks, <clears throat> there's a right-wing group that um, takes secret videos and audio tapes of uh, various people. They've gone to abortion clinics, they've gone to, you know, 
followed politicians around and released a tape of one of our local politicians, a state senator, basically discussing plans. He says they weren't real plans, they're just ideas to set up what would be an illegal campaign organization that would support him in his upcoming election. Now, the, the way some of this information was gathered uh, were people misrepresenting themselves as being supporters of his from his district. They made up names, they made up you know, locations, um, and gained his trust in that way. Um, and at some point, uh, either then or it might have been, we're not sure, but it might have been several months earlier, these people or some other people, we're not sure who, actually got the audio tape of the state senator discussing these plans. So as a, as a mainstream media person, we are kind of forced to write about journalism that was gathered in a way that we would never do. We would never uh, tell somebody that our name is this and we live here and, and blah, blah, blah. We just, we don't do that. That's against our code of ethics and yet we're forced to write about the, the, the products of that activity uh, because it's just so explosive. I mean, he ended up, you know, pulling out of the race just like within days. So that's example one. Um, well, let's, let's just talk about that one uh, first of all. Well, it's not, obviously not an incident I know anything about coming from New York, but it does raise the question, the broader question of who is a journalist? Anyone in America who expresses opinion or, or conveys information is a journalist whether they engage in techniques that are approved by the American Association of Journalistic Ethic Ethicists <coughs> is another matter, but they're, they're as, every much, a bit, as much a journalist as uh, Dan Rather. Uh, they have the same legal rights to collect information. Uh, you may not value that information. You may think that they've collected it in a dishonorable way. I probably agree with you about that. It doesn't make them less of a journalist. Uh, Glenn Greenwald, isn't he a political activist? Yeah. So is he a journalist? Everyone says he is. Yeah, the weird thing is we do value the information. It just basically violates more or less. We value the information. That's the, that's the crux of the problem. We value the information because it is useful information, but was gathered in a way that we, my, my editors would never allow me to do. That would be expressly prohibited. And then the second example I was going to throw out there, um, there's an ongoing quote unquote secret investigation involving the governor's campaign and there, um, there's been a consistent set of leaks to the Wall Street Journal editorial page in which they are you know, revealing aspects of this, this secret investigation and it's not that we're opposed to taking leaks but our newspaper's policy and, and most, of the, most of the newspapers around here that are writing about this have a policy of not using anonymous sources. So what we end up doing is quoting the Wall Street Journal, quoting anonymous sources when we ourselves would never do that. And we actually don't even know, we have good ideas, but we don't even know who their anonymous sources are, but we're sort of forced into that because otherwise it looks like we're covering something up, like we're not giving our readers the full story. You know, and, and, and so I'm just, I'm throwing it out there. I don't have a great answer except that we have been following it and we quote the Wall Street Journal quoting you know, anonymous sources, but we ourselves are, if I told my editor, well, I've got this anonymous person who's saying this and this and this about the John Doe investigation, chances are they wouldn't uh, let me do it. Well, it raises the question about surveillance by journalists again, or by whatever you want to call them, but it's, it, it also raises another question that, that um, has come up, I th I've heard it a couple times, I think, in the, in the security context, and that is, um, how do you resist or should you resist publishing what somebody else has already published that you would never have published yourself in the first place? I mean, does you, do you suspend your judgment as a result of the competition at one point and how do you justify that? It may not be justifiable. It may be necessary, but it may not be or may be very, very difficult to, um, to justify. And one possibility, of course, I think is to is to tell your readers that. And I noticed that there were, in, in the context of the, uh, was it Project Veritas, uh, that did the uh, undercover stuff, there were a number of stories, actually, that were done um, about the very issue of the ethics of their doing what they did and the ethics of uh, other journalists republishing what, what 
they did. Not a very satisfying answer to me. You but know, I, I just want to question the premise. I mean, there, there are arguments to be made in some select cases where journalists will misrepresent themselves and will use uh, hidden, a hidden camera to get certain stories and there's a long ethical qualifier about you can't get the story any other way, blah, 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 blah. The problem difference here is that somebody else did it than, than those journalists. So, uh, and then the question is, do you, do you hold your nose? Because the methods in which you got this information, although it's believed to be true and verified, or, or is there a public you know, justification the information is so interesting, in fact, it's true, that in fact you would, you would therefore be swung, swung to using it. Boy, that's, that's a tough one, I, I, I really, I would, I would not want to use that information, I'd rather get it myself, but, because you don't want to encourage these groups from doing this, you don't want to be sort of associated with them. But hell, you know, if, it's, if they've got something really uh, yes, I mean, important. Okay, I, I mean, I'll go way out and put a nice neck on the line. I would, I would consider using that under, under a whole bunch of qualifying asterisks, okay? Um, we are over time, and it doesn't look like anybody's anxious to get up and leave, but uh, maybe, is there one more question we could take, and then we'll call it? Yeah, just quickly. Uh, at the time of the Iraq War, 60% of world opinion considered America the top threat to world security, and only 20% Iraq. The Senate voted the other way around, three to one the other way around. Uh, the Reporters Without Borders ranks us 47th compared to a majority of the uh, G7 countries uh, uh, in press freedom were ranked 47th compared to 10th for Canada, 16th for Germany, uh, 22nd for Britain, 28th for Japan, and that's a majority of the, of the seven. And, only the low, only lower one was Berlusconi of Italy because he owned the press. Um, it, so who's right, the world or America? Canada. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you would say that. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Sorry to be late, but it's been a long day. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Let the Americans. Uh... Well, I, I think the reason why the U.S. is 47th in the. Uh, Borders with our borders ranking and number 30 in the Freedom House ranking that came out this week is entirely related to the growth of executive power, executive secrecy, and then the rage against any um, crack in that uh, system and the attempt to uh, punish those who um, reveal it. And I think it's obvious that following 9-11, the enormous expansion of the surveillance state and secrecy in general, as well as actions the United States would find very difficult to legitimate in front of its own people as well as the rest of the world, is the driving factor that's causing this tension between the press and the government. Now, it may also be that the press is, um, it, it's, it's bigger, it has more tools, it has more actors, and it has therefore more irresponsible actors, and that might be driving part of it as well. But I think that the answer to why the United States is so far down the list goes back to the expansion of executive power and the need to keep most of what that branch of the government is doing secret. And I would question, the methodology of those, those groups uh, are certainly something you'd want to raise questions about. Uh, they test, uh, what I've seen over the years is it, it tends to react to one incident or a couple of incidents developments in countries. I'm not justifying what, what Jay was talking about. Uh, what I'm saying is, is, is that, well, anecdotally, uh, I just came back from China uh, and had meetings there on media and media ethics and all that. And you know, uh, if, if you know, the American system, despite it being broken and all, <laughs> and all the criticism of the journalism mm -hmm. ethics, it, it's still a, it's still a, I'd put it out, I wouldn't put it 47th if that's, if that's where you would put it. Uh, yeah, uh, I remember looking at, it's hard to stay in the role of moderator, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, uh, you're but, um, uh, I, I, I looked at that, that very study when it came out and I think you're exactly right. It's very difficult when you read it to figure out what they actually did do in any um, objective 
since. I'm not saying we're... In one case, a Canadian, uh, uh, the Canada dropped from like in the top 10 to way down low. And what happened was that a, a human rights tribunal in Canada had, uh, had, had been subpoenaed or had been asked to hear a, a, a case of a reporter who had questioned, um, had said very nasty things about Muslims. And that was seen uh, as, as interference in the media system. So, I, you know, to answer your question, I, I really don't know why those figures are the way they are. Well, we're having fun, but we're going to have to call it quits here uh, and, and thank the panel uh, and thank you all for a wonderful day. Let me say before what I applaud the, the panelists here uh, that I want to thank uh, people I've been working with for the last years. I, I wouldn't have guessed one year ago on this day that I would be uh, the uh, successor to Stephen as, as director of the Ethics Center. And uh, I wouldn't have survived this year if it weren't for uh, Katie Culver, if it weren't for, uh, for Dave and Wendy, our project assistants. Wendy actually coming out of, out of uh, retirement of sorts to help out uh, when, when we had a bit of an emergency at the end. I can't remember whether we mentioned Rowan uh, Calix, our um, office assistant in the journalism school who arranged travel for many of you and did a lot of other things for us. He was absolutely fantastic. Our advisory board has been wonderful and I want to thank them for the support uh, that they've given me since I took over this job. And of course, Jim Burgess is the guy who really set all of this in motion uh, a good many years ago. So. It's, um, it's been a great day, I think. I hope that you've all enjoyed yourself. I hope that it's been uh, a useful day. <coughs> Thank you very much for coming.